Now I'm really excited to jump into this particular part of the session where we get to hear from practitioners from um, from their perspectives on where they are in terms of their commitment to partnership with students institutionally and um, what uh, yeah what, what they can share with us here today with their progress. Uh, so we have uh, Jessica Frowley, uh, Dr. Jessica Frowley from University of Sydney. We have Lucinda crossley meets from University of Wollongong and Anna McLeod from uh, RMIT University. And uh, they will be sharing their presentations today um, for before we go into more of a discussion. So Lucinda, would you like to go first and share your screen? I'll stop sharing my screen. So good morning, everybody, and thank you um, for coming along today and thank you, Anna, for um, pulling this session together. I think it's a great time, not only in the year um, where your head turns to sort of reflect on what you've been doing all year and um, in, in your role, but also there's so much change happening in the sector at the moment. You know, I think that is affecting everyone in their day-to-day -day that you can't help reflect on. Um, your efforts and the, the results of those efforts and the journeys that have got you to there and potentially what's um, yet to come. So I think it's a great point in time for us to be coming together and having conversations like this. Uh, it can't help but do anything but give us fresh ideas, connect and, um, you know, be a wonderful support to each other as we navigate um, our, our sector and the shifts um, ahead. So um, we we have a massive commitment to country down here, and I just wanted to um, share with you our version of acknowledgement to country. Um, UOW actually spans nine campuses across the Sydney metro and regional areas um, within New South Wales. We go all the way down to Bega, which is near the, the border crossing into Victoria, um, and have a strong presence all the way up and down the coast of Wollongong. We're out at Liverpool. Um, and we have our CBD campus here in Sydney. We're also um, moving into the offshore space, um, which you may have heard about. And country is incredibly um, central to everything that we do. It's an integral part of, of who we are here at UOW. Um, we are, I guess, what you would call a medium-sized institution, so roughly around um, 31 students um, as counted earlier in the year. Um, so we're probably more a mid-tier university, um, not as enormous in, in terms of student enrolments and numbers and um, uh, headcount as the, the big institutions, um, but certainly we have um, a solid commitment to education and delivery of that um, in, as, a, as an anchor employer and an anchor um, educator within our um, patches that we're located. So we pride ourselves very much on those, those large numbers um, and really trying to offer an incredibly unique and um, transformative experience for any student that joins us at any campus um, and in any program. We're about to celebrate our 50th um, year in terms of operation. And I guess something that is quite special about the University of Wollongong is that we have really been doing um, students as partners, I guess, as a, as a kind of core element of how we deliver education and how we um, work with our students from, from, you know, the very beginning. Um, we, as you can see here in the picture, this is our Wollongong base. If you haven't been to Wollongong before, um, this is what it looks like. It's an incredibly beautiful city um, situated right on the coast there. Um, it's a steel city. And I guess mm -hmm. culturally that means that we have really kind of grown up um, we're, with close contact, close connection, you know, networks and relationships are incredibly core to what we do as a city, which I think has been born into, you know, what our university is kind of built on culturally as well. So something like the concept of partnership, um, collaboration, doing things together, that really has been part of our DNA right from the get-go. And, um, you know, certainly, Heather, I hope that the image encourages you if you are um, in the area, certainly come on down and visit us at Wollongong. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly pretty place to be. So our story of partnership um, is a good one. As I, I think I've kind of laid the foundation well to kind of say that the, the, the concepts have always been there. 
um, at UOW, as it has grown and matured as an institution, we have always had things like student representation kind of built into our structures, but certainly that has been an, a maturing and an evolutionary journey in terms of how something like student, a, a, a leading student representative group operates and um, interacts as a connection point between that broad student body and um, operators and decision makers doing the business of, of university. Um, so, you know, we, we have kind of been doing this for a while. Um, just to give you an example, um, we've had the National Centre for Pass actually situated here at, um, at UOW for, for 16 years. Um, we've got uh, many, many, you know, examples of um, academics working very, very closely with their students to actually deliver and create, you know, amazing transformative educational experiences. Um, and we've had all of that kind of leading up into what at the time we called our student representative forum um, back in 2017. So just, just to give you some sort of historical context, um, back then, you know, a review and some consideration was formed into the structure of that group. And the group that we now know today um, called the Student Advisory Council was born out of that change process. Um, 2018 kind of came and went, we hurtled straight um, into those COVID years as we all experienced. And um, something really interesting happened during that COVID time in that our Student Advisory Council had to work quite closely, with, out of necessity really, with the Vice Chancellor at the time and the executive um, level of the university. That relationship was incredibly positive. They worked very um, collaboratively and very proactively together. And I think, you know, because of a result of that relationship, um, the Student Advisory Council then took a lead and actually um, promoted and got the VC at the time really on board and on side with the concept of let's cement and let's firm up our commitment to student partnership. So that's where the concept of sitting down together, as you can see there, our Vice-Chancellor, um, uh, Professor Patricia Davison, she actually, um, uh, you know, you can it's evident in the photos, she worked incredibly close as a peer with our Chair of the Student Advisory Council. They drafted the first agreement back in 2021 and ratified it with a signing. Um, and that, that came from that close relationship together. So... 2021, huge milestone in where students as partners um, kind of got to for UOW. Off the back of 2021, we went straight into a year of um, change, upheaval, change processes, reviews, and a whole lot of sort of in um, operational um, pivoting and moving around and um, a degree of kind of instability, I suppose. So the commitments that came out of that students as partners agreement in 2021, they never went away. They just weren't progressed, I guess. They just, in terms of, you know, an operational kind of um, pivot, they weren't something that was um, able to kind of land in terms of a team and a group of people and a resource to take it forward. So fast forwarding through to 2023, um, the team that Melissa, who is on the call today, and I um, were stood up in, had it firmly and um, very, very importantly kind of landed on our priority list. One of the first things that we had to do um, within our role was to actually own that work of um, taking the Students as Partners Agreement forward, which we obviously kind of sunk our teeth into very quickly and relished. Um, the, I guess, uh, when you read our agreement, um, uh, it, it has a number of core elements to it, you know, some very clearly um, stated um, elements to it that need to be delivered on if you are in any way, hand, you know, hand on heart going to say that you have, have you know, listened to what has been outlined there and you are taking it forward in, in good faith. Um, and I'll show you those in just a second. But Something that did have to be addressed very early on in the piece for us at UOW, if we were going to kind of give any anything with this agreement some shape, was to really kind of make a decision on what is the model of students as partners going to be for UOW. 
Um, resourcing was actually set aside to set up um, somewhat of a partnership office um, with a fully functioning partnership team sort of delivering on that. So there was the option there to do that if that is what UOW wanted. Um, but one of the first pieces of work that we delivered as a team was an incredibly um, deep and thorough consultative piece. And interestingly, what came out of that consultative piece was that a prescriptive partnership office was not what UOW wanted in terms of its concept and its um, grasp of, of partnership. So the sentiment that was echoed across the board in all of the consultation was that it was really about a um, decentralised model, non-prescriptive, um, and, you know, people kind of really wanting to continue that culture of um, taking the commitment to partnership and, you know, owning it for themselves and having much more of a say around how and what and um, the, the impact of partnership will be at their local level. So culturally that seems like it's something, you know, really strong and consistent for UOW that they want that ability to um, be front and centre at their application of um, partnership. Um, what that means, though, is that people are out there doing it. As we all know, we're all practitioners here in the room and people um, require and what they were really hungry for and what we were really hearing quite strongly from them was that they wanted um, a, a framework to operate within so it's a concept of, you know, what are the guardrails? What are the kind of, um, what's the space that we can occupy with something like partnership? Um, what are some practical tools? If I were to, you know, do X, Y, Z in terms of my practice, um, what can I pick up and apply? So is it is it a recognition piece um, or an asset that I can actually reward and incentivize students with? Um, is it some inspiration and some ideas on what, what does good look like in other parts of the university? What are some success stories and that kind of thing? Um, so, you know, the, the space that Mel and I occupied very much for a, a large chunk of last year was to kind of operate in this space of um, taking these commitments that were, you know, clearly stated and signed off on in that 2021 agreement, which you can see here. So, these, these are the points that we needed to hit in terms of, you know, authentically being able to deliver on um, rolling out that agreement, um, but actually providing what, um, what we could hear from our staff that they wanted. So where we landed um, was a, a large piece of work, you know, really under, under kind of um, underbuilt with... Uh, input, um, partnered co-creation, co-design, collaboration from um, a student co-committee, from our student uh, advisory council. Um, we've ran student co-labs. We've done stuff in student surveys, a really kind of rich engagement piece across 2023 to the get to the point where um, we started to frame up and shape what you can see there. Uh, we called it a framework and a toolkit. Um, and that was launched um, to a lot of um, success and celebration in November, 2023. So we're coming to the point where we're now 12 months into the application of that across the university. Um, and that gives you an idea of kind of where our priorities are. Now, our team at the moment, um, we, like everyone else, have been undergoing a whole lot of pivots and um, refocuses and um, shifts and changes in our priorities, particularly um, across this year as, as our landscape changes for everyone. So, and we can't boil the ocean. You know, we can't, we can't do everything for everyone in a very short space of time. So what we have done um, this year after we've launched that uh, engagement framework and the toolkit is really kind of focus on what are the priorities for 2024 around, you know, setting people up for success and kind of, you know, playing in that space and being really conscious around keeping our ears, you know, really kind of um, flat to the ground and listening to people around what are they doing, um, what do they need in a year like this year of lots of change, what would be helpful for them 
Um, how much do you kind of push and pull and encourage and um, create space for people to slow down and pivot themselves around something like partnership? So I guess the concept for us has been this has not been a fixed process. This has not been, you know, that prescriptive model of this is what's going to look like. These are our steps that we're going to hit and come what may, this is what it's going to be. We really have been very adaptive and very kind of, I guess, um, responsive to what is happening on the ground. Um, in addition to that, as you can see here, um, this is our, in summary, this is what our um, engagement framework looks like. Um, we have built the framework based on, I guess, core principles, core values and core behaviours of what we regard success to look like. So that can be picked up and played by anyone across the university, regardless of their role, regardless of what level they're in, um, regardless of their maturity and their experience with working with students. This should be meaningful and applicable to anyone, anywhere. And we kind of, we really kept that as a core um, tenement as we built this. So this, this has allowed that evolutionary and that kind of evolving um, look and feel to actually happen across the year because we haven't been so fixed and rigid in our, um, in our design of it. I have um, linked you there to our public page where you can go through and you can see on our university website, you know, how we've presented it um, to the outside world. Um, you won't be able to uh, log into the Stuff Cook Toolkit, unfortunately. That's um, popped away on our intranet. But it gives you a sense of the wording. Um, you will see there a video that features our VC. We um, supported her with writing the script and making sure that, um, you know, she... She spoke about students as partners in 2023 in not only a meaningful way to actually describe, you know, how it is at UOW at the time, but also kind of we we hope and we we have heard from her that um, it reflects her um, core values and her relationship to her relationship to students as partners as well. So um, we feel like we've hit a really good mark in terms of you know uh, capturing the sentiment there. But essentially, um, when we have written our framework and we've designed it, we've obviously put into a big kind of um, minestrone soup bowl all of those elements that we heard from all of the consultation with everyone else. But, you know, we really have kind of um, made sure that it is practical, it's applicable, it's something that you can pick up and look for what are the guiding principles that I need to apply in my work or my practice what, is, what does good look like, you know, um, so I can measure myself and my practice against hopefully a best practice um, and I can get a sense of how close or um, distanced I am away from that and adjust my, my practice based on what I know from that and what, um, what and where is it happening. So how can I grow my practice? How can I connect with others? How can I get those, you know, seeds of inspiration? So we really have kind of made sure that we've um, kept all of that very, very strong in front, front of mind in our design. Um, the other thing, I, I was really happy to hear those comments at the start of your session, Anna, talking about the, um, the roundtables earlier. Something that came through in our consultation and, a, and a, um, a, a connection piece that we had that has been incredibly meaningful to us here at UOW is that linkage to the alumni. Um, so we very much regard what we're doing here at, you know, at UAW with students while they're enrolled with us is giving them the safe space to actually practice their partnership in a supportive environment where we're helping them, they're helping us to grow, mature, build their confidence, um, see some great results from partnership and really kind of whet that appetite to do more and more partnership. So they might, you know, start off having a very small in experience of it or a small engagement. Um, but if that goes well, we want them to actually seek out more and more partnership and, and mature and regard themselves as, you know, someone that while they were an enrolled student with us at UOW, they had an impact, they can see the results of their efforts and they really are kind of part of the change for the university and part of the um 
creating the environment for a future student to come in and enjoy. So our model and our concept is such that if we if we give students a great experience now while they're with us as an enrolled um, student, they will go out into their graduate life as a citizen and seek those out to continue to want to make um, you know impact and good impressions on the world that we all live in. You know, and they might seek out charity board positions or they might seek out you know involvement in their local um, P and C. You know, once they're a parent, things like that. So it's, it's the kind of thing where this is not something that just starts and stops at university. Um, this is something that you really should, you know, be looking for potentially in your recruits as you're bringing students in from a, a school um, environment, but also something that you're hoping to see in your graduates. And that cycle should continue. When we kind of drilled into it, um, we are really happy to report that our brand reflects that. <laughs> Um, and we have called that out in some of our um, engagements and our assets with students. So we, we feel hand on heart that we're all kind of singing from the same song sheet. And I, I guess, you know, we, we don't see student, student partnership as this isolated thing that just happens in pockets. We really see it as being, you know, uh, embedded all over the university at every level and in every kind of way. So the concept should be there. It shouldn't be far from a UOW UAW students mind the concept of impact, the concept of being an active citizen in their experience. It really should be something um, familiar to everyone. And from our perspective, we're just there to kind of support with creating opportunities and making good opportunities. Um, another element that we have really kind of focused in on in our um, build of the toolkit has been, um, you know, showing um, rather than telling, I suppose. Um, and through that, we have really kind of worked hard to give people examples of things they can touch, they can um, apply, they can play with, they can adapt and turn into their own um, in a practical sense. So obviously, you know, the having having an, a very good and a very confident understanding of what partnership means at UOW is important um, and having all of those sort of uh, academic and those evidential um, bases to it is critical. Um, but in terms of, you know, creating and, and extending a culture of partnership across the institution, we really have kind of given the practical side um, a very strong space. And this is something that, you know, this is not once you build it once and you, you it's set and forget. This is something that is constantly evolving. You're constantly coming back and reviewing. Um, you know, people are telling you what they're actually using in class or how they'd like it improved. Um, a really good example of that has been in our toolkit, you know, we we created a space to actually pad out um, the, the processes and the structures around, you know, conducting student surveys, for example, um, because we realised that, you know, that was a space that hadn't really been kind of teased out in a lot of detail by anyone op operationally across the university. It hadn't really kind of sat um, firmly in one spot for someone to own and articulate. And there was a huge cry for... Um, for a need for it across the university. Everyone wants to run surveys with students, as you know, <laughs> um, but how to run surveys, um, how to coordinate surveys so students are actually being bombarded all the time, um, how to make sure that survey language is consistent and to the expectations around surveys are, are reasonable to our students. We, we've kind of um, given that a bit of shape and at least a starting point for a staff member to come and get the at least the, the the beginnings of what they need to do good practice in that um in that domain. And we have heard, you know, many times that something like that has been of great value across many teams at the university. Um, the imagery choices were also really important to us. We wanted to show students from all over, you know, many faculties and disciplines um, good examples and obviously having a good time doing it. This I wanted to just end on. Um, 
that we, we really are kind of at a place where at UOW we are out there in the mix, you know, doing our students as, as partners um, and really kind of, you know, uh, owning that concept of this is not prescriptive at UOW, this is not something that we're trying to get everyone to fit in a mould of. Um, what I'm showing you here is a mural that has just been completed this week at UOW and um, the, the great story behind this is this, it, it, it is actually a perfect um, example of non-prescriptive partnerships. So our faculty, uh, sorry, not faculty, our facilities um, team had just completed a beautiful renovation and uplift um, piece of work for a student space where our student um, union and student leaders are going to operate out of. Um, they actually, in, in, in true partnership, they kind of donated um, a wall um, and to the students to beautify and really kind of make the space their own, make it their home. The temptation you could see was so there for facilities to want to, you know, really give everyone the kind of, you know, here's the clear instructions of what you've got to do and what it's got to look like and this is how this whole thing's going to work. But um, our advice to them was to donate the wall and really kind of step back in terms of what the, the end result is going to be. Um, and what the, the look and feel of it is all about and the actual co-creation process, which the students were then able to come in um, and own and really kind of make their own. Um, we were able to engage a UAW alum in, it, in terms of actually doing the work. As you can see, he's a very talented artist and the result, you know, speaks for itself in terms of a beautiful legacy piece that the students who have been involved should be incredibly proud of as they all come to graduation, but also for the facilities management team to be proud of too, to actually um, kind of know that they they gave the space, they gave the advice in terms of, you know, here's what you need to do to keep the space clean and safe, et cetera, but really kind of, you know, letting the students come in and in a non-prescriptive way create that, that asset. Um, it creates work for us in that we really have to hold strong to those elements that we, you know, put into that framework right at the beginning. Um, and it's something that we have to kind of own and, you know, we we have to we have to be, you know, the the ultimate kind of um, example of, of taking something like this engagement framework and um, um, putting it to use. So that's been something that I, I've been involved in this project myself. Um, and it's something that I have had to apply and kind of uh, be the example of, you know, in terms of holding the, the engagement framework strong. But this is the end result of what you can achieve if you do that. So I guess I wanted to end there. Um, that is the UAW kind of story to date. Um, we are in a year with in, incredible change and, and what's ahead. And I guess I just wanted to kind of close on that um, statement of for us, having that framework in place has been incredibly fortuitous to go into this next chapter of what, um, what student partnership and what student representation means for, for universities in general. Um, it's something that we apply more and more and more every day and we come back to and we read and we, we really hold those um, values and those behaviours very dear to our heart and practice them. And I'm happy to answer more questions about um, uh, what partnership at UAW means later on, but I've probably over talked my section um, already and I would love to hand over to my next colleague. Thank you so much Lucinda and for sharing the story to date and this beautiful mural as a result of it as well. Um, we will move on to Jessica. So um, I'm here today to talk about our approach to um, students as partners at the University of Sydney and um, following on uh, from Lucinda, recognising that um, uh, at the University of Sydney, we're both very established in student partnership and also very new to it. And this is largely on account of our size. So we've got um, uh, in the 2023 report, we've got uh, over 67,000 students at the University of Sydney. And I think we've got about 11,000 staff and that may be even more if you if factor in um, uh, casuals that are not always recorded um, diligently. So we've got a huge university that we're working with dispersed across several campuses. And um, 
as a strategy uh, is prone to do, we have um, strategic aims to make students as citizens in their own learning. Um, and uh, in 2023, um, there was an aim to have an institutional approach to students as partners um, uh, within the university. So um, I'll talk you through how we went about uh, thinking about that, recognizing we're both uh, new and old to this in different ways, and, and that will hopefully become a little bit clearer. So if Anna, if you click the next slide. Um, so what uh, we started with was a sort of look at the evidence base for students as partners. Um, so there was a literature review, a desktop environment scan. So what records were there of existing practice um, in students as partners at the University of Sydney? Um, we had internal interviews. Um, and we had external interviews. And essentially what came about is that we had lots of experienced work with staff partnering with their students, but it was highly siloed and um, it could be very responsive to the individual contextual needs. So for example, in a faculty, you might have um, long established approaches to students as partners, either on the engagement side or on the curricular um, teaching side. Um, but that because it was siloed is that sometimes you'd get a key staff member would leave and the entire thing would, would fold and disappear because there was no way of having any institutional visibility on that. Um, we uh, spoke to 18 different external universities, higher education bodies and experts in the field um, and essentially came to the repeated thing um, within the advice was, Yes, it's diverse, but you need to have some sort of shared understanding of what you're doing. Um, otherwise, there's a sort of ineffectiveness and inefficiency as we reinvent the wheel while someone over in the faculty has already worked out that issue. And this is especially the case with, um, uh, uh, you know, administrative hurdles. So how do you set up contracts? And you've got someone learning all about it for the first time in faculty when we've got student life, library, uh, faculty programs that, that know this inside and out. And we just didn't have that. So if we click to the next slide, um, uh, we in late 2023 in November, we held our first students as partners roundtable. This was an internal um, event just for university staff and students. Our external expert facilitator was Dr. Lucy Mercer Mapstone. We were very lucky to get her on board. She really helped um, help us think about what we what we wanted to do to get people between the faculties and schools and portfolios and library to sort of talk to each other. And we'd not really done that as a university um, all in one go before. Um, we had 90 um, UCID delegates and 50% staff and 50% students. And it was probably the hardest event I've organized because we had nominations from associate deans, went to the staff, the staff nominated the students, and it took a lot of work to make sure that we were, we were on that sort of 50% ratio of staff to student to manage sort of power dynamics and conversation in the room. And the result of this was that we had an activity where we co-designed um, a student partnership charter. And if we click over, um, the aim, and uh, this is where I regret putting animations in my slides because I'm going to have to sort of click on Anna instead of clicking on my computer. So if the first thing we did was that we got people working individually, click. And um, we had 10 questions around what would a charter to mean or look like. Second step was that we made each individual transfer those uh, for two ideas to their post-it notes and they had to step three click transfer these to their two post-it notes onto 10 questions which went onto 10 different panels around the room so they were answering like what you know what would the aim of the partnership charter be um uh 
uh, how would students be recognized? How would staff be recognized? There was 10 questions and then we generated 974 post-it notes. And I know that exact number because I typed them all up into Excel and uh, many a happy day was spent doing that. So we'll click over to the next slide, Anna. Um, the next step was click. Um, we People went into staff student groups to thematically group and analyze the contributions. And then the next step was they had to report and discuss to the room. And so then they wrote up these big written artifacts and then step, they then verbally presented that back. So, and we had transcription of this. So we were sort of at this point drowning in, um, the, the needs of the university and the experience of the university. And so how we manage that is if we go to the next slide, is we got a, a quite a small group um, of staff and students from different places in the university. And the co core thing was analyzing this mass of data and coming up with a written draft. And what does that look like? And we had a few um, requirements was that it was going to be um, easy to, uh, to understand, we didn't want a huge document. Um, it wasn't really related to governance either. It, so it's not part of that space to clarify, even though it's got the language of chartership, it's more about, well, I'm partnering in my classroom. What do I do? What values do I adhere, adhere to? And the result of all of this was if we click over, um, was uh, this uh, values based um, uh tools. So how do we talk about what we're doing in different places with the same values? Because it needs to be different for our 67,000 students and 11,000 staff. It's not going to look the same in student life as it is in um, educational innovation, as it is in the library, as it is in the faculty. It's not going to look like that. And um, the way that this was come, that this came up, and I was interested when uh, Lucinda was presenting on um, the University of Wollongong's values of respect and empathy, was when you went through all the data, respect just kept on coming up and up again. And so we were going through things around, you know, do we have the pillars of partnership, you know, all the language that you, you get in these kind of documents. And um, uh, one of uh, the people doing the analysis of the data said, look, why do we need multiple values? This is just one value and it's everywhere. Why don't we use that? It's memorable, it's um, nice to work with. And it talks to a lot of the things I saw come up in um, uh, Lucinda's work and also uh, within the literature. And it was specifically around students and staff partnering together. And what does that look like? And then click, if we go over again, um, uh, the second part of this very short document that you can access is that it takes the value, respect, click, um, and that's the core value. And then if we click again, you'll see there are these principles. And then if we click again, you get these actions. Now, the actions are not um, toolkit level details. You know, they're, they're quite broad, but they recognize the different kinds of actions that might occur. So if I'm practicing partnership in my classroom and I'm not paying my students because they're doing it in curricula, that's this is just how I teach. It's just me doing good teaching. Then reward and recognition is going to look very different in that environment because it might be bound up with credit um, uh, for academic credit. It might be might look different to maybe if I am the library and I'm employing a student in a partnership capacity to co-design um, you know, the HDR space. or So it it's not going to look the same for everyone, but it's a shared starting point. And we are um, institutionally in terms of working together, uh, you know, we're, we're still finding our way. This is just some language that we've put together. Um, the next point, if we click over, is um, actions that staff and student can take is where well, you can read it. And also um, if you uh, sign up um, to it, then it starts to help us with that recording of that siloed um, diverse practice. So this is really a sort of bottom up approach. So if we click again, 
Um, and this is all still in the process of being built. So um, this isn't there, but this is how we imagine it working, is that it would allow you to get people who are doing things and um, not always calling it partnership. There have been lovely things that come out of, um, for example, a school of architecture, design and planning. We're doing lovely stuff and they were just co-designing. But, you know, it never got coded as a partnership event. And so we never get to draw on the experience of how they co-designed those tools and activities. Um, so I think there's uh, opportunities for um, better sharing at Sydney. And um, we're not there yet, but um, I, I, I'd like to think that uh, we've gathered and thought about it in a way that we, we can start um, connecting people who've got lots of experience with um, with each other. And I think that might be it. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Really appreciate your short presentation. And if you would like to hear more of a fuller story about the uh, formulation of the charter, um, Jessica will be presenting a case study at the SVM, SVA Symposium on Friday next week. Um, join us face-to-face -face or online. You can still get some tickets on our website. Uh, they're free for SVA members. Uh, now on to Anna. Thanks, Anna. Um, and well done, Jessica and Lucinda. Um, Jessica, I just can't say how much I, I really love that project sign up um, at, at the end with your form. I think that's an amazing way to just start getting better visibility over opportunities. It's certainly something that we're thinking about implementing at this end too. Um, I'll share my screen and everyone cross your fingers for me and technology. Um, and we will see how we go. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk a a bit about that respect thread because I think it's definitely an interesting one that I hadn't realised um, plays a real role in, in what we've been looking at here at RMIT. But just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I, I started back at RMIT in about 2018 and, and my role was a new one that had been created. Um, I inherited quite a unique initial state. Uh, all of us We've got such different models in terms of our student representative structures and also our university campus and, and, and size and delivery modes. So, um, I, you know, as much as I looked around at all the other universities, I couldn't find anyone in the same situation. Um, it was all just a bit different and um, really took a lot of unpacking at this end. Um, we were really quite lucky that we had a, a strong focus uh, at RMIT on investing in the student partners space, um, building off, you know, Sally Varnum's work and Student Voice Australia um, being established. Um, so we've really stayed true to the mission in terms of wanting to diversify um, student voice and um, strengthen the impact because there was a, a really common culture here at RMIT of tapping the same group of students on the shoulder for them to rubber stamp or endorse something that that university um, executives was were looking to progress um, or program program level changes that people were looking to progress. Um, so we had lots of student voice happening, but just no one could see what was going on and it was a real a real mess. Um, wasn't fulfilling its potential. Uh, students were getting sort of frustrated and disengaged because they were contributing their feedback and then hearing no outcomes. Um, one of the major things that I had a problem with was around um, how some opportunities were too formal and the, the power dynamic wasn't appropriate or the, the space safe wasn't created for students to give sort of honest feedback. Um, and probably the other one that really frustrated me was that people were reaching out like they cared about student voice, um, but they were, were reaching out in the wrong way at the wrong time at the end of a project, expecting something to be rubber stamped um, or expecting students to almost perform the role of a paid employee um, when, when providing a meaningful and informed opinion into something. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about a different approach. So yes, we are working on um, launching a student voice framework in the near future, um, but I didn't want to, we didn't want to rush into the, um, a formal document, a formal charter, uh, the environment that 
that we found ourselves in was quite combative between our uh, student union and RMIT staff culture. So that was a really interesting scenario to arrive in um, and really focused on that cultural shift first by looking at practical actions on the ground. Um, so there was a lot of cre creativity involved, a lot of strategy, uh, in, like, informal strategy, um, but this was the, the path that we, we chose to take. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about the reflections on that down the track and where we are now with the with the journey but um you know it's some of the things that i think really made the change in student voice partnership culture here at rmit were uh, utilizing small projects um that were co-designed co-created with students and brought to life with students that were often community participatory uh, projects. So our art for social change series is a really great example from the student life creative team where students were employed and participated as volunteers. It was a partnership project with the student union, which was completely unheard of at the time um, and has gone on to be one of some of the most successful projects um, staff and student partners at RMIT um, and has sort of received funding and, and happened over the last six years, which has really been a beautiful story. Um, you can see the journey of Marpil, um, Kane Wicker plat Platypus there, which is a fantastic story um, that the students got to bring to life together. Um, other, other approaches that really helped our success was increasing the transparency with student leaders in the student union. And we... Um, we did that via more sort of um, informal frequent contact with the student union, making sure that they were getting a lot of face time with the executives of the university and that they were seeing sort of practical solutions being brought to the table. Um, and, and it was really interesting to observe different scenarios um, that occur that you don't even sort of really think can can impact something that actually do. And, and thinking about some of the comments in in the deterritorializing sort of student partners um, article that we've been talking about recently, it, that human behavior element to things, you, you can't take that away. You can't ignore it. Uh, small things as simple as when the university executive and the student representatives are coming to meet to discuss funding, not having the student, uh, student representative sitting on one side of the table and all the executive and staff at the university sitting on the other, simply moving your seats and sitting at different spots so that the conversation is going to be a, a, a more collaborative and collegiate one. Um, and little subtle um, tactical things like this, I think, have really had an impact on shifting the culture of partnership between staff and students. And I think really making sure that... Um, the staff from within the student life or student support teams, um, you know, led by example and um, started to show more respect. I think hearing that word called out, Jessica and Lucinda, is, is a really big one for me. And I think that that's the key, what was key to it, is giving that respect um, unconditionally um, and, and sort of taking the high road in terms of repairing the relationship and making sure it was a really effective one moving forward. Um, I think the the other component to that human behaviour thing is celebrating and recognising each other's achievements rather than keeping it in a competitive mindset um, that can happen in some organisations or workplaces is, is recognising, you know, when our students have achieved something fantastic on their own with, without the help of the university, um, especially when it comes to student unions or representation is uh, incredibly valuable and really important as well to recognise the fantastic uh, work that they deliver and vice versa. And we've really seen that culture evolve over the last few years. Um, Student Voice Australia was a particularly helpful um, method or part of, part of the success to our culture shifting because it gave us a third party, an endorsed um, approach to come together around um, without it being one one or the other person's uh, party's idea. Um, and, and that gave us something really to anchor our strategy to. And, and to this day, we, we still hold the um, Student Voice Australia principles as the central um, sort of connection point between 
the student representation and the staff of the university and what we're working towards together, which was which was really great. And just in another example of sort of a tactical activity demonstrating um, sort of the, the student voice is valued at RMIT could be, um, you know, annually the student union presents they have a list of priorities that they would have for the university each year, um, giving them a large executive audience to present those to and discuss those with, as opposed to them just being a wish list that gets dumped on, on a vice chancellor's desk or something, um, sort of making sure that um, staff across the university do realise how seriously um, that we, we take our student voice. And, um, and I think that that's really had a great flow on as well. Um, to look a little bit more closely at a couple of phases we've been through. So coming back to that 2019, 2020 phase, um, we deliberately decided that we had to realign that ecosystem. What did it look like? Because there was, there was hackathons, there was will placements, there was all kinds of student voice happening everywhere, different committees, um, focus groups, and um, staff trying to tap students on the shoulder and, and repeatedly tapping the same students on the shoulder, which is not an effective or diverse way to have voices heard. So we had a go at realigning the ecosystem and I'll show you a picture of what that, that looks like. Um, we decided to prioritise enhancing student communication about student voice because that was, that was non-existent at the time and create some uh, better staff capability um, around engaging student voice and really fostering some best best and better practice um, in that respect. So the entire time we've been working on student voice, I've constantly felt like we're trying to rebuild the car while we're driving it down the highway. Um, and that, that's been a perpetual challenge um, for me for a number of projects that we've had to look at. And I, I don't know if there is any other way around it, but um, we've been doing both things concurrently and I feel like we are getting there and there's been some great successes. But that has been a real challenge that you, you can't completely drop student consultation and things like that um, in order to start from scratch. So, um, yeah, it's been interesting. In saying that, realigning the, the student voice ecosystem and identifying some areas for improvement, um, that, list was, that list was huge and there was no way we were going to achieve everything in that sort of one or two year window. So we had to be really targeted and we deliberately chose some specific channels um, and items for uplift, uh, looking where the, there was sort of bulk opportunities for impact, um, such as this um, student staff consultative committee representative um, and student leader training. So making sure that all student leaders received, you know, a, an effective training program that, that would help them be more successful in their um, students, student partners and student voice opportunities increasing their awareness of opportunities so that we could achieve more diversity. Um, one of the most exciting ones was we launched um, a Have Your Say Day, uh, co-created with the student union. So that was a really exciting thing. And I know some other unis have similar models um, as well. Um, and But also one of the big ones, because this is related to our, our sort of governance and compliance with the HESA Act, and that is around our SAF expenditure and communication. So um, we, we deliberately focused on those and, and were able to start making some progress at such a big, big topic. So after various models or, or different whiteboard sessions, the, the thing that really made sense to us was clustering the student voice ecosystem into four, four major categories. So we've got students involved um, you know, at a governance and strategic feedback level. That could be whether they're representing on university council, academic board, and other strategic advisory groups. And obviously we also have um, the government government surveys that are administered, such as the SES and, and the CES, and, and sort of how do we utilise student voice from those channels. Um, the space I was mostly operating in was really that um, co-creating student experience where we were managing SAF, um, our Have Your Say community, um, different clubs and collectives, and something called the Student Experience Advisory Group, which I can talk about in more detail um, at another time or down the track. Um, the one thing we're really good at but we weren't utilising is um, 
evaluating our service impact and delivery, you know, participant evaluation from programs. We're constantly asking students, you know, how, how's this going? Uh, you know, would you recommend this activity or this service at the university to, to your friends? But we were, weren't incorporating that information into um, as a, and including it as a student voice channel. And I think that's an opportunity missed. So we are really calling that out front and centre right now. Um, because if we can start to create a more meaningful picture with the different data sets available, we're, we're not going to need to tap students constantly on the shoulder to give us give us feedback about, about things that they've already told us. And then there's the um, sort of that live insights and storytelling element to it, which is a lot around our social media presence, um, you know, email and, and web engagement, and um, different sort of channels and videos from students. So hopefully that makes sense. The visual, visual definitely made me feel better rather than a massive cluster of things going on everywhere. And it really has helped us anchor in different departments of the university that the curator looks after those things. Um, at the moment, and looking ahead, we are developing a framework. Um, so there's just a little cycle diagram for you there. The, because some of these things we were good at and some of these things we we're not so good at, um, depending on the projects or departments that were happening around the university. So we're really committed to now making sure that it, it is focused on continuous improvement and we are going to get a lot better at sharing the outcomes with students. Um, so that's just a little example of our model that we're leaning into there. Um, one of the things that I think we're very successful at has been reflecting on having student voice at all levels of the organisation. So looking similar to the lived experience model, which is referenced in the healthcare um, or not for profits um, sector sometimes, and that's having students involved at the strategic and governance level, so that management level, design, delivery and evaluation and of reflecting upon that that was something that that we were really proud of but we weren't we're not telling the story about that's not visible so in terms of building out our student voice framework um, and and having a, a you know a public document a charter um, or a framework uh, a policy having that front and centre will, will certainly be something that we're calling out in terms of our approach and our commitment um, and the principles, as I mentioned earlier, from Student Voice Australia. So um, that sort of indicates a bit more about our alignment. Um, in terms of the application, sorry, I know there's a lot on this slide, but one thing I wanted to call out is around having all of these different sources of information and student voice at your fingertips, but needing to coordinate and synchronise how you're utilising that in order to get meaning and impact out of it. And we've really had the time now to test and learn and experiment with that listen and engage component needs to be on scale. It needs to be bringing in a lot of different data, particularly when we're looking at um, SAF polling and the SES insights that are captured and being able to uh, surface themes that are occurring in real time for students. Um, bringing that in a little bit further though, often when we're at that, that prioritisation stage, okay, we've surfaced all these risks and issues, what opportunities are we going to take up? So there tends to be a smaller group of students involved when you are at that phase. So we're validating those ideas and opportunities with the student union leaders, with our Have Your Say Week attendees or focus group attendees um, and aligning those to priorities uh, that have been recognised across the university um, that are student-led already. Um, again, sort of working with small group of students to co-design and deliver um, projects or new programming um, to address the risks that have emerged and then broadening back out again when we're reporting about the outcomes and, and asking for feedback on how we've gone with delivery of those. So we really see that as, a, as the ideation funnel and um, having had a sort of full two year cycle to experiment with that now for over 2023 um, and 20, so half of 2022, 2023 and the first half of 2024, it's been really interesting to watch what's occurred. Um, sorry, I've gone backwards go forwards now. Um, so just to give you an indication of the culmination of that ideation funnel over the two-year period, it included our Have Your Say Week 
um, which we ran in sort of late 2023. So we were able to take the polling ideas from students that were emerging as those key themes, work those into more meaningful um, specific topics with the student leaders across the advisory group and the student union and um, curated three really meaningful workshops at the Have Your Say Week um, about addressing financial insecurity, uh, equitable learning and support for everyone, and a connected campus of the future. Uh, in the past, we had preserved these student ideation opportunities just for students to try and you know, give them a safe place and respect the integrity of their, their views. Um, and interestingly, I think that that actually limited um, the ability to really generate practical, implementable um, opportunities. And so, the, in this instance, we brought in subject matter experts from not from a senior level across the university, but an on ground level um, from different departments, such as you know, student welfare, uh, the careers team and also the community. So we weren't afraid to even bring in the National Union of Students even came to participate in some of our workshops, Melbourne City Mission, um, Sin Media and City of Melbourne, for example. And um, I think bringing those subject matter experts in the room with the students, uh, and they were all people that we, you know, we knew had been trained well in how to manage co-design and co-creation in a respectful way. Um, and, you know, the, the ideas that were generated were just were just fantastic and some really practical solutions um, that could be in, implemented very easily and potentially have impact on, on quite a large scale. So that was really exciting to see um, the tail end of that ideation funnel coming to life. Um, and I think in since sort of 2018, this has really been the first year that I've seen meaningful ideas actually being rolled out and implemented in partnership across a variety of departments um, that students have, have co-designed and, and curated, but on scale. So there's been lots of little hidden gems such as the social art um, for change projects, but this is this model we approached over the last 24 months um, has has been fascinating. So integrating student voice into educator training, so the mandatory onboarding training that every single academic does now includes students in in that, um, which because it's a, a digitally delivered um, model is actually very uh, efficient to. Um, to do, but you know, educators have the theory. Um, we wanted to bring the heart into it as well, and um, and that's been quite successful so far um, in terms of sort of part of the compulsory training suite that that educators go through. Um, we've had a significant um, student experience improvement project launched out at Bandura, which was uh, identified through they'll have your say week and um, we're also introducing a major food security project as a result of this as well as a lot of um, sort of immediate solutions that have been uh, tactical solutions that have put in, been put into place and one of the big ones that I'm really excited about is a project enhancing the communication to students regarding academic progress and support services so students who um, you know are put on notice or at risk for their academic performance or or maybe just fail one subject, they can be really triggered by that communication and the way it's delivered. Um, so we've undertaken a project um, with our student communications team to overhaul the language that's used and also implement different campaigns to destigmatize um, failure and help students understand the support that is available rather than having them sort of go into an avoidance or shame spiral uh, at those key moments when they might be struggling with their um, academic performance. So they're just it's look very anecdotal snapshot of some of the things that are happening and sort of where we've been and where we're heading. Um, at this phase, um, our next steps will be to start investing in a formally documented framework, charter, um, you know, a, a mutual, um, something that has mutual definitions and agreed language and shared values. Um, I, I felt like it was, I didn't know where to start and which, which way we should go first. And it was such a chicken and egg and 
Um, I know all of you on the call will appreciate that things just take so much longer than you anticipate. Resources aren't always available when you need them. Um, but I think going for the practical approach to change the culture on ground, implement and pilot um, activities was the right choice because now I feel like the students are going to be more confident when we put a charter or we put a shared agreement on the table and we want to commit to each other about ways of working moving forward. And I think, to be honest, it's going to be more meaningful when the staff that are going to sign up to this and um, and commit to these ways of working moving forward, they're not just going to do it because it's a, a document on the table and they have to because it's their job. I think they've all experienced the value that can come from true engagement with students on ground and um, and how that's helping improve student experience on campus. So there's still lots of challenges um, in terms in terms of the scale and trying to make it meaningful. That's probably my biggest challenge and trying to get more visibility and document what we're doing. Um, but in terms of the success that we've had so far, I think we've been really, really lucky as well. We've had um, strong staff that support the student union, even though our student union is completely independent here at RMIT, um, and really great student leaders that have been willing to try new approaches and strategically work with the university to impact more change rather than protest at the university. So we've been really, really lucky in that sense. Right, I don't know how long that went for and I hope it made sense. It was a bit more of a stream of consciousness for me about the journey so far um, because it has it has been somewhat less formal. Um, yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back over to Anna. Thank you so much for your presentation and for everyone's presentation today. I, I I recognize that it's quite a lot to take in. It's quite a lot of content, but I hope this was helping to put everything together in terms of um, how different approaches are. It is very different from university to university. And um, we also, everyone is challenged with this uh, really broad meaning of how you can work with students, how much commitment you uh, you your commitment to various support structures uh, and things to focus on. So there is there is a lot to take in. And I really wanted to highlight that in this session that um, as much as we are doing our best to have these conversations online and really uh, create this tailored experience of sharing practice, sometimes it's not that easy because uh, we can be saying student partnerships and uh, three institutions will have completely three different uh, ways to go about it. So. Um, really keen to continue this conversation with our practitioner network.